like to introduce <laughs> Dr. Henry. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Um, and thank you really for um, having me back. It's always a pleasure to speak to um, this audience. You know, I think uh, we're all really interested in the same thing, which is helping our patients um, with genitourinary malignancies get the best treatments possible, of course. And, mm, oh boy, this is gonna be, wait, every time I turn my head, it's gonna be loud, I think. Um, and so my role in that is, of course, as a medical oncologist, as Katie said, and um, I do treat all GU cancers. But for our focus today, um, since the last time I presented here was about three years ago, my focus today is really on some of the updates that we've had in our use of chemotherapy in prostate cancer, um, because it's been a rapidly growing and changing um, landscape. And I would say our treatment for prostate cancer today for men with advanced prostate cancer is completely different than it was three years ago the last time I was speaking to this group. So again, thank you for having me. So just a couple objectives of the talk. We're gonna go through some of the historical use of chemotherapy in the traditional setting of castrate-resistant prostate cancer, but then I'll spend some time focusing on the new data which supports uh, chemotherapy use even earlier in hormone-sensitive disease. Um, we'll look at some of the emerging data regarding the use of chemotherapy even earlier for men with non-metastatic prostate cancer. And then at the end, I'll just wrap up with a few slides looking at some of the novel treatment strategies because, again, the, the landscapes are always changing in how we use systemic therapy for, um, for this malignancy. And there are some things that are on the horizon that I think are going to be coming in the next few years. And so we'll go through some of those just so that you're familiar with them. So prostate cancer, as many of you know, is a unique malignancy in that um, tumor growth and proliferation really moves through this trajectory from a hormone-naive state to eventual castrate-resistant disease. And for decades, the standard of care for newly diagnosed hormone-naive metastatic um, prostate cancer would have been hormone ablation, and that's done with um, GnRH therapy, which decreases testicular synthesis, of course, that can be given either as monotherapy or um, in combination with androgen receptor inhibitors, um, such as bicalutamide, nilutamide, flutamide. Um, certainly, there's also occasionally a role for surgical castration, and that would have been a, an, a, that is still an appropriate treatment strategy for men who prefer it. Um, but as men kind of progress through the course of their disease, they would be continued on these androgen deprivation treatments. Uh, until such time as the disease progressed, either with progressing PSA, progressing metastatic disease, um, new sites of metastatic disease, et cetera. And at that time, they were really determined to have what we term castrate-resistant disease. And prior to 2010, really, these patients had very limited options. So their options would be limited at that point to chemotherapy. And the traditional chemotherapy drug is docetaxel. The brand name is Taxotere, so you may hear of it either way. Um, and that really had, is the kind of the standard. Um, Taxotir is a chemotherapy that was um, approved in 2004, and we've been using it ever since for prostate cancer. Just a couple of um, slides on how it works. So chemotherapy is a microtubule inhibitor. So when a cell is going through division, um, when a cell is dividing, it, many of you may kind of recall these slides from, I, I have flashbacks to this from medical school and stuff, but. Um, the, the cell forms the spindle apparatus across which the chromosomes will separate into two ends of the cell. The cell divides down the middle and then cell goes on with replication. The way docetaxel works is it actually binds to these microtubules that are used to form the spindle apparatus. It actually sort of locks it in place so that the spindle apparatus can't kind of unbuild itself as the cell is dividing. And so um, the cell just kind of freezes in this point of division. It ends up uh, leading to cell apoptosis and death because the cell can't divide effectively. The way we give taxotere, so um, of course, this is one of my main jobs in treating men with prostate cancer is giving chemotherapy. So it's an IV chemotherapy given a, in a weight-based dose of 75 milligrams per meter squared. It's given once every three weeks, and it can be given through a central or a peripheral IV, so men don't necessarily need a port or a PICC line for, um, for this chemotherapy. Um, but sometimes it does lead to um, some scarring, and it is a little bit of a vesicant, so if they're on chemotherapy for a long time, sometimes they do end up with a port. Um, in the castrate-resistant setting, 
Taxotere has to be given with prednisone, five milligrams twice a day. That's the way it was studied and approved. And then it has to be given with some dexamethasone pre-medication to help mitigate toxicity. The landmark clinical trial that led to the approval of Taxotere, as I mentioned, this was back in 2004. Um, so we're talking about about 15 years ago. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 12 years ago. I've lost track of time. So the, the study was comparing docetaxel with a, an older chemotherapy drug called mitoxantrone, um, which was at that time kind of the standard that we used for, to, to, to salvage men who had progressed on hormone therapy. Um, the chemotherapy was studied in a couple different forms. It was that the Q3 week form, which is how we ultimately give it. It was also studied in a weekly um, dosing to see if that was any better. And then for the duration of the chemotherapy, men were continued on their um, medical castration therapy. And the results at that time, again, there was really nothing in this space, and so the results were really favorable um, in, in favor of chemotherapy. So about half of men who had castrate-resistant disease were shown to have a PSA response with this drug. The time to progression um, was about six months, so that resulted in men getting an average of somewhere between eight to ten cycles of chemotherapy before they progressed. And then the median overall survival, again, for these men with castrate-resistant disease ended up being about 19 months. And that was a three-month survival advantage over mitoxantrone, which again was kind of the, the standard salvage at that point. But what about toxicity? So we're you know, giving men potentially a few extra months of life with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. How tolerable is the treatment? That is, of course, an important consideration. And generally speaking, in the spectrum of chemotherapy drugs that we deliver, Taxotere is very well tolerated. Um, but there are toxicities that we worry about and we counsel patients about and that we monitor for and support them through. So about 65 to 7% of men can experience um, fluid retention. That can be anything from mild peripheral edema in the legs to really serious complications with pleural effusions that require drainage or massive peripheral edema that requires diuretics. Um, the steroids, I mentioned the dexamethasone premedication does help with that particular side effect. And so that's why men have to take the dexamethasone beforehand, is to keep the rates of that fluid retention complication down. Um, in addition, you can see some GI toxicity, so low-grade nausea, but this is by no means the most metagenic of our chemotherapy drugs. So most men are able to be controlled with some as-needed antiemetic therapy at home without having a significant amount of nausea. Um, in about a third of men, there will be some hematologic toxicity. So this can be neutropenia, anemia, or thrombocytopenia. And it's important to note here, um, what we really worry about when patients become neutropenic is the risk of febrile neutropenia, um, which is a potentially life-threatening complication, of course. And with taxotere in prostate cancer, it's actually quite low. Less than 5% of men will experience a febrile neutropenia. Um, Taxotere can cause a sensory neuropathy. This happens in the hands and feet, a little bit like a stocking glove sensation. It starts out just in the fingertips and the toes. Um, that is very much a cumulative toxicity, so the longer a man is exposed to taxotere or other taxane chemotherapies, the more likely it is that they'll experience that toxicity. So it does not tend to happen with earlier cycles. Rarely, men can also experience radiation recall if they've had previous radiation. Um, typically, this happens in men who've had palliative radiation to the bone. Um, then they'll have an area of pain and swelling when they start their chemotherapy. And then we also monitor for liver function um, and, of course, blood counts, as I already mentioned. Taxotere can occasionally cause some abnormalities in uh, the transaminases AST and ALT. So we follow for those things. Um, but again, you know, this was really kind of the only choice in this landscape. And after men failed chemotherapy, or after the chemotherapy failed the men, really, um, there really weren't a lot of other options, and, and it was pretty bleak landscape after that point. Um, and we often used mitoxantrone as a salvage approach, but mitoxantrone has never been shown to improve survival. It may have some improvement in terms of quality of life, but the trade-offs really become a little bit more questionable at that point when we're giving chemotherapy, you know, simply to preserve a patient's, uh, or to delay symptoms related to the patient's disease. So supportive care really was um, kind of the only option at that point after chemotherapy. Now, work done since that time has, of course, helped us redefine the mechanism of progression in castrate-resistant disease. So we now have an understanding that some tumors may actually become hormone ultrasensitive, that despite androgen deprivation, which eliminates about 90 to 95 percent of circulating testosterone, some tumors just become very good at using the microscopic amount of testosterone that remains and um, can 
continue driving tumor growth, even with these small amounts of testosterone circulating. And so this helped us gain an understanding that the androgen receptor pathway may still be active in men who have castrate-resistant disease. And that led to, um, as many of you know, the approval of some of these novel agents that we're really using quite frequently now. Um, abiraterone, which is an inhibitor of adrenal synthesis of testosterone, and enzalutamide, which is a multi-level androgen receptor inhibitor. In addition to that, we've had two other new therapies approved for men with castrate-resistant disease since 2010. One of those is the immunotherapy drug Provenge, which is a vaccine and one of which is Zofigo or radium-223, which is a radiopharmaceutical which targets bone metastatic prostate cancer. And all of those drugs improve survival in men with castrate-resistant disease. <laughs> so this kind of period from 2010 until the current time, you know, I sort of fondly refer to as the renaissance in prostate cancer, because in less than five years, we ended up with these five new therapies, all approved, all demonstrate survival benefits. I would point out that um, these survival benefits, of course, are in the range of, again, about two to four months, so we're talking about months of life, um, but the hope being that as we sequence these therapies together, we can help men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer live longer. In addition, we had the approval of denosumab, um, which is a supportive care agent to prevent men from having complications from their bone metastatic prostate cancer. And I would say that the um, approvals of abiraterone and enzalutamide really specifically changed the way that we treat prostate cancer. Um, when these drugs were approved, many, uh, many of us kind of started to advocate that really, you know, in this case, maybe we just don't want to really use chemotherapy early at all. We should push chemotherapy perhaps even later, as late as we can, because chemotherapy delayed is toxicity delayed, and abiraterone and enzalutamide are both very well-tolerated drugs. They're oral, so patients like them. They're convenient. Um, they require a little less intensive monitoring, perhaps. So there are some real advantages in using those agents, especially when we're talking about, again, extension in months of life. But of course, that's not what my talk is about today. So um, you might imagine that there's some kind of new changes in that idea of pushing chemotherapy later and later. <clears throat> 